Africa. Oh, great. Okay. Is that better? It's for the recording, I think. Oh, okay. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think, I don't think it. Okay. Don't Can people hear me okay? It's, it's, it's for recording, so it's I'm not sorry. So out. I'm going to continue to speak loudly because it's only for recording. <laughs> I, anyway, as I was saying, sorry about that. Um, Stacia George, uh, Director of Chemonics West and, and uh, Central Africa and Haiti Division, and a former colleague of mine, like I said, from USAID from the Office for Transition Initiatives. And so it's uh, going to be a delightful panel. Thanks to Stacia, we have a very elegant flow in terms of the run of show. Uh, the, the, these these uh, different presentations all blend and tell a story, which is what we want uh, from a panel like this. So each, uh, each one of these professionals is going to speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll uh, open it up to Q&A, and we'll, we'll um, make sure that everyone gets a chance to speak and ask some good questions, okay? So take it away, Bill. All right. Uh, thanks very much, Ryan, for the kind introduction to the colleagues in the panel. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, thinking about how neuroscience, neurobiology, and behavioral science can be used to help inform novel interventions to address and counter uh, violent extremism. So I come to you as a representative from the uh, cognitive science field, so the study of how uh, brain operations influence behavior, uh, but also as a practitioner of security and peace, kind of from both sides of the fence. What I thought I would do for the first couple of minutes of my presentation is tell you a little bit about the interests of the current laboratory I run, which is focused on building scalable interventions that have quantifiable impact on conflict prevention and reconciliation. And if you could go to the next slide. We do that by focusing on the neurobiological and psychological mechanisms undergirding four different categories or bends of psychological phenomena. Those range over how we build trust between people, um, how we establish those mechanisms of empathy, and the flip side of that, how we uh, can dehumanize each other in conflict circumstances especially. Um, the experience of conflict and how that uh, defines or feeds issues related to trauma and victimhood. And finally, looking at the neural correlates and the behavioral correlates of what it means to consider yourself to be a member of one group rather than another. So when you... Is it possible to stand on one side or the other? Yeah, sure. Is that better for everybody if I'm over here? Okay, thank you for the feedback. So um, if you combine these four different psychological mechanisms in different ways, uh, then you can kind of see connections to lots of phenomena that are relevant for preventing or countering violent extremism. So those include whom you consider to be a threat or how successful you are at integrating with uh, a new culture or society that you're a part of as a uh, migrant or refugee fleeing conflict, for example. Also, of course, dehumanization, since, as I'll show you later, oftentimes dehumanizing the other or an outgroup member is part of uh, preparation to become violent uh, against them. There are also issues of relative deprivation or injustice, which are generally indexed against the culture or community you consider yourself uh, to be a part of. And finally, there are issues related to stress and trauma. You may think that uh, countering violent extremism is all about top-down processes, if you will, related to uh, messaging or framing, but it is just as much about setting the conditions such that you deal with these neurobiological mechanisms that are put under stress and trauma. And in that way, you can build bridges to allow growth in identity and address concerns of dehumanization. So at the end of the day, there really are going to be a, a couple of take-home points from the, the seven or so minutes I have left with you. One is that um, preventing and countering violent extremism is as much about content, about form as it is content. That is, it's about the psychology and neurobiology of small group socialization. And we have all kinds of tools we can use to intervene on that process to help uh, prevent or counter violent extremism. And my second take home point will be that um, while our community, I think, is very good at running randomized controlled trials to test the efficacy of interventions, that we, I think, need to integrate science into that process of designing interventions much earlier on. And so our lab's flavor for that uh, tightly integrated uh, science-informed design process is just that, science-informed design. And it's one where you test your interventions early on and you construct them with these psychological mechanisms in mind.
All right, so if I have to pull up short, uh, just because I know we started a bit late, you've got, we've gotten to the bottom line, and, and we can talk more about that in, in Q&A. Next slide, please. So inside of our lab, we take that science-informed design process I just mentioned and try to test out interventions that we uh, can determine in the field have a quantifiable impact on the psychological phenomenon we're studying. And where that science-informed design process discovers white space, say at the intersection of something like messaging and the socialization of identity, then we, we, we feed that back into the community and make it a basic science research problem, a 6-1 problem in the parlance of, of the Department of Defense world at least. And so uh, we have this nice tight connection between the labs that we work with as our uh, basic research arms at the University of Pennsylvania, for example, where our lead scientist actually resides, Dr. Emile Bernal. And then finally, we try to bring the results of the basic research and our application of it out into the world so we can get feedback from practitioners and ensure that these interventions are actionable, that they actually make a difference in the prevention of conflict or in helping us cope with its aftermath. Next slide, please. So one of our principal goals when we think about knowledge and education is to make people wise to the way their brain works. It turns out that just doing that can actually have an impact on the way you behave. So you can think about it a little bit like an Alcoholics Anonymous program, right, where you just need to learn about what's going on up here and how the environment interacts with the shape or channel your behavior. And if you do that, that can often lead to enlightening discussions about how you need to restructure your environment so that you don't, uh, you know, crack open another bottle if you're a recovering alcoholic, for instance. And it also turns out that when you talk to the cognitive scientists and neurobiologists who do this work, that they uh, often use this elephant and rider metaphor. And the idea is, is that we spend a lot of our time in the CVE world thinking about the rider of the elephant. But the rider of the elephant is on top of this massive beast that's lumbering along, that's influenced by its environment, and uh, against which the rider uh, actually only has a small amount of control and against which the writer has relatively little knowledge, conscious access to what the elephant's doing at any given time. So you are the writer on the elephant of your brain uh, in, in many respects. And just bringing that home can usefully highlight how we might be able to, to design interventions that think as much about the writer, the elephant, and the environment as opposed to just the writer. Next slide, please. So how do we get at the inner world of both the elephant and the writer so we can design an intervention? Well, on the one hand, we might do it by sensorizing those neurobiological mechanisms that enact all of that psychology we just talked about. Okay, so we can do that. And in fact, our technologies have gotten a lot better. Uh, we are able to do uh, non-invasive electroencephalogram assessments of brain states to look at things like uh, surprise. Um, we are able to use peripheral neurophysiologic measures like heart rate variability or galvanic skin response and biofeedback paradigm to get people to, to think about uh, the inner state of their brain. And the bottom line here is that these quantitative instruments offer you new insight into those precursor mechanisms that are going to affect the efficacy of your preventing and countering violent extremism intervention. So that's just something useful to keep in mind, that we can access the inner world of both the elephant and the rider in different ways. The next slide also highlights that we can access it using, if you go to the next one, uh, traditional mechanisms, which are, uh, say, content analysis against the kinds of things we say, or uh, an analysis of both the form and the content of, say, the kinds of media we consume. So uh, we actually have a partnership with Nielsen Neuroscience uh, that allows us to do real-time testing in the lab where we sensorize folks using that first set of sensors I showed you, whilst also looking at the type of media they consume and their reactions to it. And that can give you even more comprehensive insight to the elephant and the rider. If you go to the next slide. So uh, before we move into talking about a couple of the psychological phenomena in the first slide, I, I want to uh, make a big picture point about the nature of the brain. So I think of our brains as being predictive devices that help us forecast what the world is like so we can get our bodies around in them and survive. This is Donna Hicks' point about evolutionary biology from uh, the session earlier today, if, if you attended that. It's trying to keep you alive and, and well. And that's a little bit different from the traditional notion of the brain, which is, is this information processor that's kind of disconnected from the body, where you take your sensory input, you do some processing, and then you output a behavior. That's, that's, a, that's 
accurate in some respects. But I think what it misses is that the brain is constantly doing this feed forward prediction process. And one of the most important questions you can ask is how do the expectations of the brain differ from the reality the brain is encountering? And to quickly drive that home for countering violent extremism, one of the most important questions I think you can ask, say, a diaspora community that's attempting to integrate into uh, its new home is how connected do you feel uh, to that, that new community? That, that gets at that uh, prediction uh, error. If you go to the next couple of slides, thank you. So our brain is all about creating shortcuts between those how your body feels at any given time, that's an important sense of data, and what it is processing. And if you go to the next slide, you can see how things like uh, the unconscious associations we make between the shape of stimuli influence whether or not you think that's a face or not. And if you're like most people, you think the one on the left is. And so if you go to the next slide, what that means is that there are all of these mechanisms in the brain that we can frame and intervene on that influence those unconscious associations, that influence whether or not you feel like you belong uh, to the new community you've integrated to. Next slide. And in that way, we can intervene really across any one of these, either blocks, if you will, either top down with a cognitive intervention or bottom up by shaping how the body reacts to a, a given environment or by shaping the environment so the body gives a different signal back to the brain. And so the next uh, uh, few slides, I'm gonna fly through it so I only have a minute left is that this brain's tendency to, to like to, to, to think that it's right and to like to keep you alive, as I mentioned earlier, can, can be leveraged to think about novel interventions that might deal with that mismatch. So if you go to the next slide, and that's because the same neurophysiologic processes that are responsible for making judgments about threats to your body are also uh, responsible for making judgments about threats to your identity. And that can be assayed with various tools, like if you go to the next slide, a dehumanization tool that attempts to pick out how you think about both your in-group and your out-group, next slide, by looking at how much you identify with the groups that you find yourselves in, next slide, and if you go to the next slide, by looking at how you rate out-groups on this uh, scent of humanity scale from something like uh, Charles Darwin's uh, uh, corpus. So the next two slides look at some empirical data that shows that how you rate people on that dehumanization scale correlates with things like how you feel about immigration policy toward them, right? So again, censorize the whole system. All right, since I've got about 10 seconds left, let me go ahead and press on to my final couple of slides that point out that you often want to go meta with these measures. You want to ask not only how do you feel about the outgroup, but how do you think the outgroup feels about you? because that can get past the self-report bias we often see in uh, psychology. And we've got a whole set of fascinating data that's been stress tested across multiple countries on that front. All right, so let's go ahead and skip uh, forward. Uh, this correlates, by the way, with your willingness to use violence to resolve a problem, how connected you feel to your in-group and how connected you feel to uh, your society. Uh, so extremely important. And the final slide, if you go ahead three more, let's skip the stress stuff just points out that if we're gonna get at scientific answers to these questions about connectedness that take those mechanisms seriously, we need to start doing those experiments with the interventions even before they're fielded and put that cycle of science-informed design into a closed loop process so we know we're having the impact on these elephant and rider mechanisms that our policy analysis uh, tells us uh, we think we should have. All right, and that's it. If you skip ahead to the last slide, uh, all the lessons here are the ones that I highlighted up front because I suspected uh, I would run out of time. And I really look forward to your questions and comments uh, during the uh, last part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to sit over here so that everybody can see the slides. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, before we get started, I just want to make sure since SB social behavior change and social behavior change communications is um, somewhat new to CVE, and so I just want to make sure that we're all using same terminology and have like we're all on the same page. Um, so I just want to um, first point out that um, I'm going to say SBCC or SBC, depending on what I'm talking about. And uh, there's three key elements with SBCC. Um, one is communication, um, which is using channels, interventions, messages, materials, and themes that are um, 
targeted at specific populations, needs, and preferences. Um, behavior change through efforts to make specific actions easier, feasible, closer to an ideal that will prevent, in this case, or counter violent extremism. And social change to achieve shifts in the definition of an issue. In this case, um, the issue is CVE, so we would talk about people's participation and engagement, um, policies, gender norms, and relations. Um, in recent years, I think that, no, not yet. Um, in recent years, SBC has started to play an increasing role in CVE programming, um, given that SBC draws heavily from um, neuroscientific considerations of what drives human behavior. The use of SBCC approaches has been found to be promising to prevent, redirect, um, or respond to participation in violent extremism. Um, SBCC also capitalizes on the practices that have already been used for messaging through technology such as text messaging, social media, websites, etc., cetera, um, to counter radicalization of individuals. However, there are weaknesses. Um, and because SBCC has only recently begun to establish its place as an approach in CVE, uh, there is limited data to um, its benefits um, and its effectiveness. Um, but the evidence base is growing. Next slide, please. Um, approaching violent extremism as a public health issue offers intriguing opportunities. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend a few moments discussing um, several SBC and public health related models and frameworks that have been considered or used to design um, CVE programs abroad as well as in the United States. And at the end, because I may run out of time, um, we can discuss further their benefits as well as like what it looks like. Next. So the first one is a four-tiered um, model for public health prevention. And um, you can tell that there are four tiers and the most important aspect of each one is that when you're applying this model, you need to think about what prevention strategies and what is the target population that you're working for. So um, is it communities, is it individuals, is it a government structure? Um, if you're, uh, in terms of the primary, the primary prevention category could be broadly construed as community level strategies that mitigate risk. Um, secondary is um, programs target a subset of the population who are considered to be at risk of the violence. Tertiary are directed at individuals who have already adopted extremist ideology or are in contact with um, violent extremism extremists, um, but are not engaged in planning or following through with those acts. And uh, premature prevention programs could attempt to address social determinants of risk by promoting policies and systemic changes that address um, norms and um, rights issues. Um, on the other hand, um, there is another way to look at prevention strategies and a model. Um, uh, the World Health Organization's World Report on Violence and Health and its uh, Global Status Report on Violence Prevention promote a different definition where they've targeted um, the prevention strategies based on specific intervention groups. So one group is the universal intervention group, which are aimed at groups or general populations without regard to individual risk. Another one is selected interventions, which are aimed at those considered at heightened risk for violence. And the final is an indicated interventions, which are aimed at those who have already demonstrated violent behaviors. Next slide. So here we have a um, CDC 10 Essential Public Health Services um, framework, and it's a new conceptual framework for public health approach to um, of addressing violent extremism, which aims at specifically targeting policy and practice shifts. Um, the public health approach often op um, offers opportunities for multi-purpose programming, avoiding stigma, and leveraging existing public health resources. Next. Um, we also have the community-based uh, participatory research model, and I find this model to be quite interesting. Um, I'm going to call it the CBPR, because that's how we use it. Um, and it's seen as an alternative approach that could be used to develop programs aimed at reducing risk for violent extremism um, at the community level. It focuses on community engagement and partnership and recognizes the importance of communities in preventing violence and changing um, social norms. Um, 
In particular, um, this model provides a, f a roadmap for how to enhance the different types of social connections that you would have um, in any like public health problem or um, violent extremism challenge. Um, and because it, it's, the focus is to build resilient communities. And it's developed to alter the power dynamic previously inherent in a um, research subject relationship um, because it brings together community members, institutions, the researchers, and everybody's equal and everybody's working to solve one problem. Um, this model could also help um, to link a specific network of adaptive capacities to a positive trajectory in a community after a threat or a disaster, um, resulting in the prevention of events that disrupt communities. And for example, with regards to violence, um, CVE in particular, a challenge or threat could be seen as the potential violent um, for violent extremists to recruit individuals to their cause in the community and potentially um, engage in violence. Um, successful adaptation to this threat would be a community that comes together so that its members are no longer vulnerable to this threat. And I just want to point out that community is defined in many different ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be a structure like houses or a village. It could be a set of peers. It could be a youth group and, and so forth. Next slide. So I can't um, not talk about CV and not discuss behavioral economics and the human-centered design. Um, since we talk about design thinking in another model that I'm going to talk about right after this one, um, I'm going to focus on behavioral economics, um, BE, um, which is what this is here. And BCC is behavior change communications, because I know it's a lot of acronyms. Um, so BE posits that contextual and behavioral factors are more important than rational choice. And, um, and this includes CVE. It's not just public health or education or, or so forth. Um, and it's actually much more important than push and pull factors. So if this is accurate, um, if we accept this concept, um, it might be good to focus on the social and emotional world of those who use violence to express their um, beliefs. And um, this is very well linked to what Bill was discussing previously. Um, research is seeking to identify factors and biases that youth that push people towards certain decisions, although this is still in its infancy. Next slide. Um, this is the behavior-centered design. Um, it's actually developed by the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Um, they've used it for several different types of public health programs. What I find interesting about this uh, model is that it's actually behavior-focused. And so um, its entire process is generic and is based on a theory of change. It's based on a theory of behavior change. So you, um, you can use it for anything. You can use it for government, CVE, education, and, and so forth. Um, it also sets out a, this, to me, this is a, I know it's a little cumbersome, the image that they've created, but it actually is a very practical five-step process for designing and evaluating interventions based on this theory for behavior change. And it incorporates a novel approach to formative research that applies um, design thinking, which I've mentioned before, and professional creativity to intervention production, and relies on academic um, best practice for process and impact evaluation. Next slide. And then the last, um, the last one that I want to mention, which is um, a, a, a big go-to for CDC and others um, in terms of violent extremism and just preventing violence in general, is um, the socioeconomical um, model for change. Um, the important about this model is that there's four different layers. And um, the idea of this model is that for every layer, you have a set of interventions. And to actually see full behavior and systemic change, so social and behavior change, you actually have to um, create a comprehensive program that addresses each one of those layers. So in specific, the individual and self is um, the biological and personal history of that person. Um, the relationship, which is the interpersonal, focuses on the family members, communities, and so forth. Um, the community level 
also focuses on the community but on a larger scale as well as the workplace and so forth and then the societal enabling environment which is the fourth looks at the broad societal factors so it's the social norms systemic changes policies and so on um, recognizing that violence is multifaceted um, with biological psycholo psychological social and environmental roots I feel that this is a very good model to consider when you're implementing an SBC CVE program and is actually what I recommend for Chemonics. Um, and it also addresses a lot of cultural norms that sometimes you forget or like fall through the cracks. <laughs> Next slide. I'm on my last slide. Um, I think one thing that, that I find quite interesting is that um, the focus a lot of times is on the mass media, the countering. Um, the, the counter messaging and the counter narratives and so forth, which are great. Um, but what research has shown is that, and in fact, we actually have to have a more comprehensive program. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the program has to be developed in a very comprehensive way. It just needs to mean that we have to recognize that there may other, be other programs there that we need to integrate with and piggyback on to ensure that we're addressing all those four layers, as I've shown in that model there. And we can discuss further what that means. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a control freak, so I can pick my own slide. Um, all right. So, uh, you know, I have the privilege of being up here, and I'm coming from a public health background. And you know, you all know way more about violent extremism than I do. And I'll tell you how I got into this field. Um, as kind of an introduction. But the, the initial presentations really have me thinking. So as opposed to telling you how I got into it and what I know, quote unquote, I just want to say the, the questions that the two previous presentations have raised for me that I am continuing to struggle with as I think about this, and coming from a public health perspective, is when she showed that public health you know, pyramid of preliminary intervention, I think that works for things like if you find high-risk groups for breast cancer, you can intervene early. If you find high-risk groups even for HIV or something like that, um, you can intervene in direct interventions towards them. When we're talking about, and this really kind of frightens me a little bit too, identifying high-risk groups for potential violent behavior or, and they haven't acted on it yet. What are we doing? What are we intervening? What are the markers? Are we infringing on people's liberties and their civil liberties? I think we have to be really careful. What also really frustrates me is coming from a mental health perspective is that a lot of times these programs are like, well, we're going to identify people and then just toss them over to mental health. With what diagnosis? You know what I mean? Mental health is a very specific field with very specific treatments, some of which are evidence-based, not a lot, um, that are being practiced in the field. So we have to be very careful about thinking about what that next step is. So I, even though I advocate for taking a public health approach to violent extremism, and I think it's an interesting framework, without thinking through what that means, um, we have a real, we're at a real risk of kind of really altering um, what public health means and really infringing on some, some rights. The other thing I want to kind of talk about when violent extremism, when we think about this, is there's two components to it, I kind of think about it, an ideological one and a violent one. It's, we're talking about what people think about other people, as we heard earlier, but then we're talking about taking those thoughts and rather than reflecting grievances through, you know, pro-social ways or something like that, taking a violent approach. And I think that that needs to be thought out as well. What are we trying to address with our interventions and with our knowledge? Are we trying to change ideologies of the way people think, or are we trying to change their propensity to violence? So I come at this um, as somebody who studies suicide, actually. So my background and what I spend most of my time doing is researching suicide. And um, as I started working with colleagues at RAND about violent extremism, I noticed a lot of parallels. So for example, for suicide, there's the thought to kill yourself, I want to kill myself, or I feel alone, or I'm in a lot of pain. And then there's the act. If I, have a, if I think that I want to kill myself and there's a gun really close by, then my likelihood of dying and killing myself is really high versus if there's no gun and there's a bunch of pills, well, those are, that's a little bit more reversible. So even if I attempt, I might still survive. Anyway, so these are the parallels. And what I really want to talk to you about today then is how I came upon this, which wasn't thinking about why are people violent, why, are people think, why do people think these thoughts, but rather to actually learn from what was happening in the field. And this is really common in, in, in public health. So for example, 
before we knew that HIV was causing AIDS, we knew that people were developing symptoms. Um, if people you know, and the band played on, it's a really great book that kind of describes this. And we can intervene. So before we even knew the exact virus that was causing um, AIDS, uh, you know, an AIDS-related death, we were intervening. We were enforcing kind of behavioral models. We knew that certain behaviors were kind of, there was a propensity for certain behaviors to lead to infection and to lead to AIDS. And so I really wanted to go and talk to the community members and see what are you doing to prevent violent extremism? What are your kind of notions that you have? Um, and could we enforce, uh, could we improve evaluation of existing efforts so that we could contribute to the science? Does that resonate with people, what I'm saying? Yeah, so if you can evaluate your program where you have a lens, a certain lens, um, and if, it's, if you're effective, then that actually helps us understand why people are engaging in potentially violent behaviors. So um, there are community-based programs, but little is known about their effectiveness. These are kind of a sample of the programs that we found in our environmental scan, and I'll show you what our methods were. Um, I don't need to talk to you about any of these. But I do think, actually, this is one of the similarities between um, violent extremism and suicide and why evaluations are so challenging and why I don't think that they're done very frequently is because it's a super rare event. And in violent extremism, I would even call, in suicide at least, sometimes we predict people who've attempted, people who have thoughts about suicide, people who've died by suicide, we can actually do some research. For violent extremism, so I would caution that sometimes we don't even know what outcomes we're predicting. Are we predicting somebody who's been arrested, somebody who has thoughts, somebody who has actions, who's engaged in something? Um, and so that kind of uh, vagueness, if you will, or that kind of range of outcomes uh, really kind of muddles the field, to be honest. Um, and it does for suicide as well. So, the end product that we came up with, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with, is this toolkit for countering, uh, a toolkit for evaluating CVE programs. So what we do is not try to say contact Rand or contact a professional, but if you are administering a CVE program, it's really challenging, but here is a guidebook for you to um, evaluate it. And so our, it was informed by research, and that's what I want to kind of finish with. Um, this is what we did, a lit review and a survey of programs. For our lit review, we found 200 studies that were evaluations of existing CVE programs. Um, we only saw seven that actually linked their, we only found seven evaluations that linked their activities to outcomes. Um, and you were saying before that you know we were good at RCTs. We didn't find any RCTs, so I don't know where these CVE RCTs are, but we really um, you know, didn't find much. And again, I don't think that this is unique to CVE, so I'm not trying to slam people who are trying to do evaluation works. I think in public health, we see this a lot, especially in my field in mental public health, but I do think it calls for the need to be more systematic and to be more scientific, because right now we're basing things off, and if we're trying to implement these programs, we're really basing it off of a really shallow, like really shallow <laughs> scientific um, bench. Um, this was, I mean, so this is like the common fall, like, not randomly assigned, no control groups. Um, a lot of them were in places other than the US and Europe. Um, so we're dealing with kind of very specific populations. So our survey of programs, we identified 94 CVE programs um, through kind of a comprehensive environmental scan that were operating in the US. So I should say we're only looking at programs that are operating in the US. Um, we tried to kind of take an approach to all different forms of extremism. Um, and we had interviews with 28. We tried to contact all of them. Some of them are kind of websites that have nothing behind them, so there was no person kind of attached to them, and they may be kind of remnants from an existing program that was now underfunded or not funded at all. So um, we did talk to 28, and we had around an hour and a half conversations with them to really understand their programs. Um, so this is what we found is kind of a really guiding framework to understand what is currently happening in the United States for preventing violent extremism. So pro programs are focused at either communities in which potential violent extremists exists and how you can kind of identify these people who are at risk and intervene, or they're identified as individuals at risk. This is really, I mean, it sounds really simple, but as we start, if we think about evaluation and starting thinking about one of those two things, that's a really good kind of starting point um, to think through your evaluation and what the 
what the mentality is behind your intervention and, and your conceptual framework for thinking about violent extremism. For individuals at risk of violent extremism, we found basically five objectives that these programs commonly had. Um, some of them tried to counter violent extremist opinions and ideology. So an example of this would be a website where a former extremist kind of intervenes with somebody who's expressing um, thoughts and challenges that, or promote, say, you know, these are myth, like myths about jihad and this is you know, the truth about it or whatever. Um, improving well-being and address moral concerns that people have. So this is often comes from a framework that uh, the root of violent extremism has a mental health issue, and so we have to like think about mental health perspectives. Enhance positive social networks. Um, soccer like games for for communities that may be at risk for suicide. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, address political grievances. So this is like people who think that you know there's political stuff. Um, and then improve social and economic uh, integration, which kind of comes from a perspective that you know these people are not well integrated in communities. That's that's a bias. So these are all different approaches. And what our guidebook tries to do is say, like, you might think all of them, but your program should really probably only focus on one or two because they're so diverse. Um, and if you choose one, then our guidebook will provide you with key measures to think about this. So, so you're focusing on individuals that, that, and you believe that you're trying to promote pro-social networks. Here's a good strategy for evaluating that program. So we can learn whether it's someone's no networks that are actually increasing the propensity for violent behavior. I just want to talk briefly about the community approaches. And those of you who have pictures can take it. So understanding risk factors and gatekeeper, teaching clerics about potential people, building community capacity. Um, influential members, so identifying key nodes within communities and kind of focusing on them, uh, creating accepting environments, uh, policies that address political grievances. So this is, that's like basically giving people a voice when they have, um, when they express dissent or something of that support, and then strengthening resource capacity within communities. Um, we, you guys all know logic models, so I'm done, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to attempt to try to pull and weave some of these pieces all together. Um, those of us who've worked in the CV realm for a while, messaging frequently comes up as something in order to address violent extremist recruitment. But I think the thing that's been very frustrating uh, for many of us is the data component that, that came up uh, in the conversations about how hard it is to find real data in terms of what works and what doesn't. And this is why a group of us at Commonics, myself and Deborah and Jenna Karp and Katie Gerentz, um, decided we would just, let's look outside of the traditional CV realm and let's look at behavior, people who work on behavior change in other fields, whether it's like education, psychology, um, neuroscience, um, biology, and the health fields, where in particular the health field has been working on social behavior change communications for decades and has been refining its model. So why not look at what best practices come out of that and at least have that as a starting point. If we don't have much data, at least maybe we can see what's already there that works in other fields and see whether we might be able to weave that into an approach um, and maybe that'll get us closer. So as a result of this research, um, we came up with a series of findings and uh, we, a lot of what I'm gonna say is captured in a paper we just put on our website, uh, which you can uh, pick up or it's on, our ta on the table out there. But I would say as a CPA practitioner, uh, there were high points and low points of this research. So for me, the, starting with the low point, when I, I was really excited to look at social behavior change communications in health because I was hoping there would be a silver bullet that we had just not found yet that maybe we could take and try to apply into the CVE field. And my colleagues are nodding because they've sat in the room when I've just been despondent uh, when I found that that, that did not occur. Um, but, but the good news is, I think, um, when we were looking at it as, when people are designing social behavior change communications efforts for CVE, a lot of the approaches were mirroring some of the best practices in the health field. So it's so like, okay, the good news is it appears we're, we're kind of at a good starting point. You know, we might be going in the right direction. The other good thing was when we started looking at it, we saw there were some 
differentiators between the approaches, which I think are really critical and that we've been leaving behind in social behavior change communications for CBE that are important for us to, to integrate. And then obviously as well, when looking more, uh, writ large, for example, the models that um, Deborah was presenting, there's some really interesting ways of just stepping back and looking at the way we're addressing this problem from a different, from a different perspective. Um, so a few key points. The first one I want to make, which is one that Deborah made and want to reinforce um, very strongly, is the fact that social behavior change communications is not just messages through media. Um, and that is where a lot of the CV approaches are going wrong. They're focusing on like, what can I throw on Twitter or Facebook or WhatsApp to be able to directly counter some of these messages. But social behavior change communications really involves so much more. It's about the messages themselves, as Deborah was saying. We're talking about the, um, trying to influence the behaviors and then writ large the, so the social norms. And more importantly, even if you're doing these social behavior change communications efforts, they will not be successful if you do not partner them with interventions that remove the barriers to changing that behavior or to reinforce the messages that you're trying to um, put forward. So um, you can do the best efforts you want at social behavior change communications, but if you are not coupling that, um, it will not be successful. And I think. That is a really important thing for us to take away because frequently uh, the social behavior change communications elements are being done sometimes siloed rather than thinking about how do they reinforce each other. So starting from that point, that's the first piece. The, other piece, the second point that I want to make is one that many of us know, but saying it explicitly, really seeing that direct counter messaging it has not been effective. And look at, when you look at the psychology and many of the discussions we had here as well as the, in the earlier session is this makes sense when you look at psychology and uh, biologically how we respond when someone is trying to counter our specific values, right? It's a different part of the brain. It's not the rational part of the brain. It's the part of the brain that responds to a, a threat. Um, and so as a result, you're just going to shut down from that message. If you're just trying to say to someone, well, you know, ISIS, ISIS says this, and you're saying, well, ISIS is wrong, you know, this is really what you should believe, that does not go over very well. And that seems obvious, but that really is, has been frequently the starting point. Um, so I think what's, we're learning to go beyond that. What we are starting to see works is counter narratives. Um, and so that counter narratives are really, um, using both the messaging elements as well as the interventions to uh, address the motivations for an individual who is potentially going down the path for violent extremism. So my third point that I want to make is, OK, what are those motivations? And I want to give a real shout out to Equal Access if there's anyone in the room. Um, kudos. Uh, I think they have a really nice framework for how they capture uh, what motivates human behavior. And they have four categories. Um, the first one is critical significance. That all human beings have a drive or desire to have an ability to be significant, whether it's in their family, some people need it in their community, some people need it nationally or internationally, but there is that drive. And Tom Stahl spoke yesterday about the circumstances when people are not able to realize that, what happens. So when you're trying to look at critical significance and you're looking at counter narratives, you might look at counter narratives that talk about, okay, you are someone, you can be someone, right? And here's how you can be someone. But you need to couple that with interventions that allow them to act upon that. So not just telling people, telling youth, you know, you can be a leader in your community, you couple it with youth programs that allow them to actually practice that and be that and realize that. The second, after critical significance, they talk about is grievances, which you hear a lot of people focusing on in the CBE world. Um, and it can be a long list, which, which we could spend a lot, a lot of time on. But I'll give an example of a grievance. One that comes up frequently is, for example, government services. The government is not being responsive to my community. They're not giving me what I need, or they're, they're giving everyone else things and ignoring me. So when you're doing a counter narrative in, in that perspective, you're going to design one that is trying to illustrate that the government is being responsive to, to people, that they, they, it is not that way, but you have to couple it with the interventions that actually make it that way. So working with the government to help them respond. So it's not just the messages, you have to make reality match the rhetoric. The third area that they talk about is um, identity threat. 
And as Bill was saying, and others have said, it is the same, when someone is under identity threat, it's the same as a physical threat, right? So the counter narratives that they talk about being effective when someone feels like their identity is under threat is building trust and confidence between the groups that, uh, that feel that they're threatening each other. So really focusing on narratives that build those relationships. And the fourth area is related to social inclusion. All human beings have a need to be around others or be with others. And that actually comes from a survival mechanism from a long time ago. Uh, that is why when people are excluded, you start to see other types of behavior. And this is why you see a lot of the social um, cohesion programming, counter, uh, counter narratives related to social cohesion, but also programming that helps to build it as well. So my next point, how do you figure out then how to design those counter, counter narratives? Formative research is cr critical. This may seem obvious, but one of the things that came in looking at the methodologies from the health field was the fact that they really invest in for formative research. Deep formative research that looks at what drives human behaviors, not just like what's happening, uh, which is frequently what, is, what people look at, it's what is driving what's happening behaviorally, social norms, and diving deep on that. And the second piece that's linked to that is then doing uh, testing of your messaging and approaches in advance of rolling it out with rigorous reviews. And in the CV world, you're seeing more and more research, uh, an openness to research and an openness to providing funding. It's nowhere near where the, the health field is. But I think also there's a lack of willingness to allow the time to do the appropriate design before you roll things, before you roll things out. So I think that's one thing we can really invest in is trying to create the space for people to do it, do the design and do it right. The next, the next piece that I'd like to, or point I'd like to make that came out of looking at this field is it appears that social workers have some of the most effective tools for uh, re getting people in violent extremist groups out. And this seems really obvious when you start thinking about it. They're, they're trained in how to deal with people who are going through very difficult circumstances and how to talk to them and how to influence them. But we're not really integrating social workers into our program. You rarely hear people speak about that. You definitely rarely uh, hear about psychologists being, being brought in to help design approaches and help design messages. So uh, I'm just making an, a, a point of advocacy for really using social workers or in, integrating them. We have a program in Mauritania right now. We've been using social workers to help um, help design appropriate uh, approaches um, that we're doing with individuals. In Congo, we did so, some change, uh, behavior change using Congolese psychologists to help us design. There are ways we can do it, um, but we just need to be deliberate about it. And that leads to my last point, which is we can really learn a lot um, as well as be more effective by bringing in different, different fields and looking at what they're working on and the lessons that they've learned. So it's looking at health fields and the best practices that some of the things I just laid out um, and different approaches. It's looking at education, uh, um, the social emotional learning uh, research that is done in the education field is rigorous and data driven. And there are direct correlations between social emotional learning, effective social emotional learning, and a reduction in a tendency towards criminality and violence. Why people aren't making this connection more in the CVU world is beyond, is beyond me, but we can. Uh, what's great, there's actually data there. So reaching out to others, using, when we're doing programming on the ground, look at health workers on the ground. They're, they, they look at violence. Most people don't think about that. They work on violence um, from day to day. They're interacting with individuals. So just kind of getting out, getting out of our traditional bubbles um, to be able to integrate some lessons and just look up, look out, and then uh, bring others in to be able to be the most effective on these types of efforts. Thanks. All right. And uh, thank you all, first of all, for, for those fascinating uh, presentations. I wanted to start, we have 32 and a half minutes left. I wanted to start by asking how many of you are healthcare professionals? All right. How many are, so, okay, social workers and psychologists, cool. right? All right, yeah, thanks for the shout out. Social um, how many of you have lived experience with violent extremism? So what, question? 
lived experience with violent extremism. All right, how many of you are um, uh, study CBE uh, as a sort of a, a development challenge that you're trying to address? How many of you are peace builders? Would you consider yourself peace builders? Okay, of course. How many of you military, former military, law enforcement? All right, okay. All right, if you look around the room at all of the different people that raise their hands, this is an interesting conversation in that it's bringing together a group of people who don't normally necessarily sit down and talk to one another. Um, and with a shout out to the social workers and, and, and psychologists. The reason that I bring that up is because each one of us is an expert in our field, right? But there's a lot that all of us don't know. That's why we're having a Q&A and not a comment and a okay? So, um, and I was there for a lot of bad behavior yesterday where people got up and gave a speech and I'm going to be ruthless. Um, I'm going to ask for three questions. For each question, I'm going to ask one of these guys to volunteer to answer the question um, as it's being asked. And then the fourth person can kind of mop up, but I'm going to try to, we're going to try to do it as quickly as possible because I'd really like, I'm, I'm assuming that there are quite a few questions in the audience that people have um, where they would really like to engage on this topic. Um, before I jump into that, are the scholarship recipients that I was told would be here, are they here by any chance? Okay, that has completely fallen through. So um, I am ready to take uh, uh, questions from anybody from the audience uh, to the extent that there are one. We're going to go boy, girl, by a boy, girl, or man, woman. Uh, if you don't mind, as long as we can, that's usually what takes all the time. Right? So, and we're starting with this lady here. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you all very much for your oh, presentations actually, actually. and uh, sharing all of your knowledge and experience. And, and can you speak up because everybody in the room wants to hear you. Sure. And say who you are. And say who yes, you are. yes. My name is Stacy Shamber and I usually need a microphone, so thanks for the reminder that this is not actually projecting. Um, I work for the International Civil Society Action Network and we uh, basically support about 60 women-led organizations globally who work in peace and security. Many of them are on the front lines doing CVE work and obviously they know their local culture and context the best. Um, so my question for you is really, given the various theories and methodologies that you work with, which ones would you recommend that we try to train or convey to them the most to be most effective in supporting them to do their work. Thank you. Thank you. Which of you would like to take that question? Okay, he's going to take that question, Rajiv. And Rajiv, you can... No, 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 no. Sorry. sorry. We're going to continue to ask the questions. You get to isolate and think about that question. Okay. <laughs> this gentleman over here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Theo Dolan with FHI 360. and. Um, I appreciate looking at different models, like uh, public health models for behavior change communication, but I wasn't hearing about uh, peace building models. Um, there's a ton of data around behavior change communication for peace building. It's been done for eons. And uh, rather than debate the distinction between CBE and peace building, I guess I'd just like to ask what lessons, uh, Deborah and Anastasia, you've learned from, from peace building behavior change communications. I can try. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, how about this young lady here? Hi, Angie Yodermina from Green String Network in Nairobi, Kenya. We do this. We deal with the brain stuff, but we want to know how do we research it? How do we, as a small little local Kenyan organization, tap into labs? I know, Bill, you're going to want to answer this. We've talked with you, but. It is the cutting edge and it's what makes change and we see it and we hear it, but we can't get access because we're far off and a lot of the academic work that's being done in East Africa is not on this cutting edge. Excellent. So we're, we're starting, we're keeping those three so you get to answer any of them as you want, but let's start with Rashid. So the first question was which of these models is best? Um, for your organization that you would want to disseminate. So I'm going to kind of not answer your question because I don't think that there's one that's the best. These are theoretical frameworks. These are, th oh, sorry, Stan. These are theoretical frameworks that aren't true. They're just kind of ways of approaching a problem um, from a different orientation. So what I would really recommend and what we recommend is that 
for people to have a conceptual model, because actually that's what is usually lacking. So whether it comes from a public health perspective or a behavioral economics perspective, I don't think it really matters. I don't care about that. I just want to know that they have thought through the theoretical model through which they're trying to encourage behavioral change. I think if we start pitting them against each other, we're just gonna go down a rabbit hole that's gonna be totally counterproductive. Okay, Stacia, can you take that? Okay, uh, so it, uh, thank you for your question. And it's funny because we were so intent on not looking at what is even remotely touching the CVE realm that we didn't look at the peace building framework. So I appreciate you bringing that up, um, particularly because also, as I was saying, we put this initial paper out and we really want feedback on it. And if other people have things to contribute, it's, it's by no means complete. Um, and so I think actually taking a look at the peace building uh, frameworks and those lessons is a great next step for us. So I appreciate you, you raising that. No, thanks for the great set of questions. And Angie, I appreciate uh, your question. It's a pleasure to see you face to face. So how do we make the knowledge that sets inside these academic silos accessible to practitioners is really the thrust of your question. It's a critically important one. I think uh, sometimes uh, we have to take some risks as practitioners. That is, we have to be willing to reach into a silo and take some science and translate it into an intervention. And that's a risky process. The academics often don't want to do it, right, because they're, they're not 100% confident in the burgeoning theory they're building yet. And the practitioners and transition agents ha have to take uh, some risk. Your um, randomized controlled trial, if we're lucky enough to have those, right, um, may fail. And as a, someone who cares about the beneficiary community you're serving with your heartbeats every day, that, that's tough to, to deal with. So I think what can happen is we can meet, meet in the middle. Organizations like ours, like Comonix, like RAND, can kind of broker the expectations of the scientists so that they can understand that their knowledge doesn't do anyone any good if it's siloed and not translated. And what we can do on the government and transition partner side is be a little bit more risk acceptant and think about how we work with the translators of science to provide an evidence base that demonstrates the intervention actually has an effect. Because once you have that, then you're off to the races, right? You know what works and you can try it in other contexts. And in that regard, we really look forward to seeing you in December, uh, potentially, for uh, some interventions that we're going to try out with uh, potentially the Kenyan uh, police force vis-a-vis -vis community relations and dehumanization. But more on that later. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I just want to give also one clarification on my response on the peace building frameworks. Um, I was talking more broadly about social behavior change, but in ter terms of social behavior change communications in the peace building world, I definitely looked at that. and. That is where you saw some, a lot of similarities um, and, and really echoed and reinforced to me, oh, great, like we, we're, we're going in the right direction, right? So I think, I think that's very positive is that you're seeing across these fields these best practices being, being adapted. Okay. All right, we have 23 and minutes and 45 seconds left. Let's give a round of applause to the Q&A folks, both questions and answers, because we're rolling through this quickly, so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to direct whatever the first, I, I want to ask if anyone has a question for Deborah, please. And if you're male, then you get a special bonus, because we're going boy, girl, boy, girl. Uh, uh, anybody, anybody? OK, I see a question here for Deborah that is not from a male, but that's OK. Mary stuff. how do you prevent this work from being used as an excuse for not addressing structural issues of injustices? Okay. Is that something you feel that you can... I can answer it based on social behavior change. Okay, all right. So, okay, we'll take a couple of additional ones from this side of the room. I got it. I'm sorry? Only for Deborah or also for... No, for, for, every, for anyone. <coughs> Thanks. Um, all right, let's do a gentleman this time. Yeah, thank you very much, Estasia, for the presentation. I am Sam Cromer. I, I am from Liberia. My question is, I, we, we represent the Kondo Reconciliation Group in Liberia. We've dealt with a situation for 20 plus years. My question is, we believe that any animal, if sufficiently deprived or provoke, we attack. And our solution has been 
dealing with it. I am mad because then the victim will finish it. My second question is, do you find... What was the question? Do you find acknowledgement, identification with the victims as a strong suggestion to resolve the problem? And the second question is, do you consider the venue of the violence as a victim also? Is anyone inclined to take that particular one? Those questions? Sure, I can. All right, Bill, Bill will try to answer that one. Ma'am. Hello, my name is Marianne Tonkink. I'm um, working in the field of mental health and psychosocial support, and I'm a medical anthropologist. And I'm working with the Institute of Justice and Reconciliation in South Africa for a couple of years to bring our field, the mental health and psychosocial support field, together with the peace building field. This is not easy. We have not the same communication. There's a lot of confusion about, about words, about definitions, about what is trauma, and all these kind of things. We did a mapping exercise among, I think, 74 organizations, mental health and, and peace building organizations working on the ground. They don't, uh, uh, can find each other. They don't know how to work with each other. They are very biased about each other. So I think we have to do a lot of work and, and that it's very important that we link up each other and that we have to find a framework in which we recognize ourselves, in which we recognize our work, in which we not are afraid that the other field will take away our work. And um, I really, I, I'm curious about, so, so curious about it. What's the, what's the question? The question is, do you have ideas how we, as two different fields with different languages, can link up because I do think that we can make a better world if we link up. Okay, all right. There was a question in there. Um, Rajiv, do you, would you like that? Okay, and then Stacia, you can um, take us, take us, you can respond to any of them as you wish. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to repeat your question one more time just to make sure I have the right answer. Or okay. Sorry, here's something. My concern is that some people might want to focus on the neuroscience aspects, what's in the mind, mm -hmm. and therefore not focus on what's happening outside structural issues of injustice. They need both to be addressed, and I have a concern about people choosing to address only one. Okay. Um, so I, I guess I was the right person to answer that question. Um, so th th I would say that with social behavior change, you actually do look at both constructs. Um, and so um, there are actually different processes. I showed one of the frameworks that I um, think is very good, the BCD um, framework, but there's also um, others that you could use. But it goes to focusing on specific behaviors and then looking at all contract, constructs. So it's biological, psycho, psychological, um, uh, structural, and so forth. So um, when you're dealing with, a lot of people forget the S in social behavior change and they just focus on the behavior change. But the reality is to have long-term impact, you do have to focus on the S. And that includes the structural, the social norms, the policies, and so forth. So um, I, I do agree with you. Um, sometimes we even have that problem in education and health. Um, and and it, it is an ongoing reminder for, for everybody that works in, in development, I think. Um, I, I hope I've answered your question. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's for Bill, oh, Bill's next. That's oh, Bill's next. This, Sorry. Yeah. What? Okay. I hope this isn't too confusing. <laughs> yeah, thanks for a great set of questions. I want to uh, poach a little bit on Mary's question, which I think is a fantastic one, uh, which is to say that um, the environment structure is just as important as the elephant and rider. So I'm fully in agreement that if you're going to change the path the elephant goes down, you've got to pay attention to what's on the path, not just what's in the elephant's head. Uh, critically important for a comprehensive approach. And that's actually validated by ample findings from social psychology and things like the fundamental attribution error. Right, where for praiseworthy actions, we tend psychologically to want to download causality uh, onto uh, ourselves, and for the bad actions, we want to download causality onto the environment. And really, it's, it's both. Um, to the honorable gentleman from Liberia, two great questions. Um, uh, some quick responses. Uh, first, uh, I do think that there is a sense in which to successfully set the conditions for reconciliation that the perpetrators of violence have to identify with the victim, right? They have to acknowledge the common humanity uh, that, that we all share. 
And, and I, I know I'm biased, but that's what I think in part the cognitive sciences do for us. Uh, even though a lot of these experiments are conducted on weird populations in the technical sense of the term, white, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic citizens, right? They are nonetheless hopefully giving us knowledge about the common humanity we share by virtue of all having the same kinds of brains and, and living in, in many of the same environments. So um, I think part of what a successful intervention does is it causes the perpetrator to recognize the humanity of the victim so that really, guess what? This connects to Donna Hicks' presentation this morning. When I do harm to a victim, who am I harming if I identify with them? Myself. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a nice way to jujitsu the problem, if you will. Um, your second point about uh, do um, you have to uh, um, uh, consider the perpetrator of, as a violence of being victims themselves. Um, I think that in some cases almost follows from this idea of taking the effective structure and agency. The venue. The venue. Ah, the venue. Oh, venue. yes. Yeah. So does it influence how violence unfolds? Do you consider the venue as a victim of the violence? Interesting. Yeah. So. Um, uh, and by venue, you mean the environment? Because there are local laws in the, on the venue. Yeah. Not hit somebody on Google. Right. They hit somebody, look at the law. Right, right. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Yeah, that's a great question. So this also connects to the point that Mary was making about structure. So uh, think about uh, the set of rules, laws, and customs that regulate interaction. Uh, restorative justice needs to be aimed at those as well. And when you violate a compact that's enabling common humanity to develop, uh, then you need to repair that violation. I'm with you all the way. Okay. And then over to Rajiv, please. Thanks. So from a transdisciplinary perspective or an inter, from a trans or an interdisciplinary perspective, I mean, it's kind of what I was, I've been doing for the past 12 years, sometimes successfully and sometimes hopefully unsuccessfully. Um, and I do think that the, the key to, I mean, this is just, I mean, there, nature just had a whole issue dedicated to transdisciplinary research last year. So I think that it's something that's being talked about, but I'm not going to say that there's best practices because I don't think that there are. Um, and I think that that's a structure of how academics, the, the, the how academics proceed, how they are advanced, their career development, I think it all gets in the way. But I think at this point, documenting effort, engaging in transdis trans or interdisciplinary efforts, documenting your successes and your weaknesses and sharing those is actually the only, and doing something in a systematic way. And we've begun doing that. Um, so we, I have a project that I'm engaged in looking at um, resilience building in the Gulf of Mexico region after hurricanes and things like that. And it's a very interdisciplinary approach and formalizing that and testing how communications are working and documenting those communications as part of it in the effort to inform, but I don't think it's a well-developed field. I, and I'm going to use the opportunity that I have the mic to get this issue about structure, structure versus individual. I think it's really important, but the worst evaluations and the biggest hindrance to evaluations is when organizations get too caught up because they think, Oh my God, there's all these causes of what of this social condition that we're trying to study and uh, how do we evaluate the st societal impacts and blah, blah, blah. I think the best evaluations are just to keep it so simple and say, you're not denying that there's other issues, in, but your ch the, the path that you've taken is communicating about changing someone's a counter narrative about ideology that's your path you're not discounting this whole other thing that's going on that's contributing to the phenomenon but you're just saying this is my lane this is where i'm going to study um and that's what i'm going to evaluate that makes it so much more tangible and you know i think i've just seen things people just throw up their hands because they get so caught up in the complexity of the issue um and it's a real hindrance i think to to Per, you know, to advancing the field. Do you have any final thoughts on any of these? No. Okay, okay. so we'll keep moving along. we got 13 minutes to go, please, everyone. Great. Okay, uh, let's see. Boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. I think I'm looking for a male, believe it or not. Okay, this gentleman. I could be wrong. I'm Sam Yen. I'm from Eastern of DRC. We are working with at uh, local NGOs. And I have my concern, it's about trauma and victimhood. And what? Victimhood. victimhood. In the eastern of DRC, we are working with a survivor of war. And uh, we have one case. 
that we need your concern. We meet one child. Her mother was raped. And my family take that child. We are living for, with her for four years. We, are, we already try our best to help her, to take her to the good school, but she's not changed. She doesn't want to, ha to, have a, to be smart. She eat a lot. She's failing at the school. Now, it is now four, four years we're doing our best. How to help this? kids who have that uh, problem, because we have uh, several, key, several kids in the uh, eastern of Congo who have the problem like that, how to help that kid to come out of that trauma. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I predict you will have a lot of people who will want to talk to you after, um, but Rashid has agreed to take that first question. Hi, I'm Erica Vianderen from World Vision. One of the conversations we've been having within our organization is whether CVE programming is best integrated among, alongside other programming or as a standalone program. And I wonder from sort of the concepts and frameworks you guys are exploring here, if you have, one of you has a strong opinion or recommendations on that. Okay. All right, Stacia's agreed. Okay, um, anyone else? Uh, we can take this gentleman here. He's been raising his hand. Uh, yeah, with the glasses. Uh, thank you. My name is Rhett Sangster. I um, work on reconciliation in Canada uh, with our indige with indigenous our history in, uh, in Canada. Um, and I want to follow up a little bit on some of the structural things they're talking about. Um, we are dealing with things like how do you address racism and, and how do you make some of the structural changes. So how do what do we learn from social behavioral change models and what the brain works to actually to reach the decision makers, the, the systems uh, to change some of the structures. So. Okay, that actually fits with some of the stuff that Bill had to slide through on his. So, again, Deborah, we're going to let you like back. Oh, oh you could, okay. The two, the two of them are going to piggyback. Okay, and hopefully we may even have time for another round of questions if we do it quickly. I think your question is a really important one. Um, I can't come. I'm not a clinician, and I can't comment on the individual case. Um, but I do a lot of work, and my history is doing work on post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's where my mind went to. There are, um, the unfortunate thing is that, um, I think that what we've learned is that even for kids who have the symptoms of PTSD, we can't kind of address the social environment exclusively. We have to actually get um, into their thoughts about the experience. And, and there are evidence-based treatments for them. Um, it's hard to find good quality care in the United States um, with that is offering those evidence-based treatments. I don't know um, what it's like kind of where you are and whether you can access it. I've tried to find it for a family member in India, um, and it was, it, it was challenging to find a child psychiatrist or a psychologist, let alone then trying to put the qualifications of somebody who provides evidence-based care. Um, so it's a challenge, um, but I do think at the very least, uh, you, it, it's, when, when we have kids exposed at this level, we have to address the cognitions underneath it, as well as the schooling, the nutrition, and everything else that goes along with it. So it's a not satisfying answer, I realize, but um, I uh, commend you for all that you've done for this person. Could, could I no, ask Stacia? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for your question, and it is, it is kind of a chicken egg problem, right? Um, on the one hand, you want to do very specific CVE programming because you're trying, um, you don't want it to get watered down. You want it to be very specific against the behaviors that are driving that particular phenomena. But as discussed, at the same time, you, when you're trying to address the behaviors of that individual, you do have to look at the systems and the social norms and the bigger environment around them. So that leads you to then have to think about the other types of programming that's required. And I, I think there needs to be a combination of both. I, I think you, there, are, there should be explicit CVE programs, but also that have explicit linkages 
to programming that addresses the broader environment or the social condition. So just being more deliberate about, about a broader systematic approach. And what I like about systems thinking is it's, it's forcing people to step back and do the chain, the causal chains, right? Um, and that, I think, is also helping us to run into each other more. Right, um, which I think is great. Working across different fields and realizing, um, particularly on the mental health side, that's really coming coming out um, in CV. So, it's not the most satisfying answer, but I think where I've seen it work the best is being able to be very targeted, while also similar to the public health models, working on the enabling environment around it. Now, great set of questions, uh, uh, Brett, to weigh in on, on your issue. How can we put this information in the hands of uh, decision makers, uh, elites, right, and others who are kind of steering policy? I think the first thing we can do, and this addresses your question as well, is to connect this to broader policy levers that they can control. Uh, so when I think about the integration of diaspora immigrant communities, those who have fled conflict into other uh, cultures, um, I would address it as an issue of uh, trauma, resilience, and stress, and then bring tools that the policymakers are already thinking about using to help that community out and just reframe them, right? So connect it to broader issues in the same systemic way that, uh, that Stacia mentioned. Um, and then uh, secondly, I think you have to meet policymakers and elite decision makers on their own terms. Um, what that means is we as a community need to develop novel analytics, decision making tools that will speak uh, to those decision makers. So for instance, can we build an early warning system that detects dehumanizing interaction in action, either in what we say to each other or in the types of interactions that are occurring so that I can provide a policymaker early warning that they might be having an issue emerge between two uh, cultures or groups so they can uh, intervene um, you know, before it becomes problematic. And in that regard, if I can selfishly say, our lab is growing. We, we, we're looking for four additional hires. So go to our website, beyondconflictint.org. We're, we're building both of those things. Uh, some trauma tools that translate a lot of the science of stress and trauma into modern standard Arabic so we can make that knowledge accessible to Arabic-speaking populations in refugee camps. Uh, and we're also building an early warning system called Decoding Dehumanization. And we're looking for project leads to assist in both those efforts. Um, hi, I, Brett, I just wanted to also add that um, in addition to the great information that Bill provided as suggestions, um, that advocacy is like that last layer of the socio-ecological model. Um, it, it is part of the structural and societal change that you would have to create, and that includes having data. Um, I don't think any um, policymaker is going to make a decision if you can't demonstrate that there's data that relates to it. Um, we experience that in health all the time, um, even to, um, you know, like some of the countries I've worked for and have worked in in Asia, like um, testing um, pregnant women for anemia. Um, you know, we had to dem that wasn't part of their um, ANC visits, and we had to demonstrate that that was something beneficial financially for them um, if they tested and women were um, healthier and they delivered healthier babies and so forth. I'm just giving you an example, but I think it translates to anything that you do. Um, so I. And the other thing that I would do is also have representation of that population that you're serving um, with you when you're talking to policymakers. You know, I think there's something to be said, and it's very powerful when you actually have people that are going through those experiences and how they have become, um, how they have excelled and bro broken whatever barriers are there for them and have become change agents themselves. Okay. All right, um, and we know it's all about relative deprivation and the food is right outside. We, okay, all right. So I, I was gonna actually allow for one last question if, if folks are, if, okay. Um, and it's gotta go to a lady, so I will turn it to you. A woman, excuse me. Um, I have a closing question. My name's Cameron Pipes. I work for go. Management closing Systems question. International, MSI. Um, you've won the CBE Powerball and you're taking the money as a lump sum. You're not encumbered by any deliverable deadlines, work plans, monitoring evaluation plans, and it's not going to function on a one to five year cycle. How do you spend your money in this field? Wow. OK. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we have two minutes and 30 seconds to answer that question. Who won the Powerball? Who, who wants to start? 
go for it. All right. <laughs> um, I, I would invest significantly in social emotional learning, particularly for the ages of three to eight, uh, because that's when you can have the greatest influence on an individual's behavior and their attitudes towards others, um, and has long standing impact and data behind it. So I would invest a significant amount there, as well as um, trauma, dealing with trauma, helping people to deal with trauma, the mental health aspects, and helping to connect um, individual support for mental health and developing models that can be applied in context where there's not a lot of mental health workers and can be kind of training of trainers model models. I would um, not create a new program, but invest in things that were already happening and promote those people to do evaluations of their programs, rigorous evaluations of their programs. Yeah. Um, I would. I, I agree with Rajiv, and I would add that I would actually do the initial research versus just doing the evaluation at the end. I think that um, a lot of times we're all pressured by our donors to like get things done very quickly, but we do need to like create a pushback and just say we actually have to do this initial research. I'm looking at Ryan because he's here. <laughs> um, initial research to actually ensure that whatever we're doing, the interventions that we we've created and designed are going to work. And then I would actually invest in evaluation and monitoring throughout the interventions to make sure that they're still working. Because within the realm of behavior change, like the person changes who they are. And um, you need to make sure that what you're doing, what you're doing in the beginning is not what they're going to need at the end. And you have literally 30 seconds. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to footstop Deborah's last point about the need to bring along representatives from the communities you are working with to every conversation you have with policymakers. So important, so neglected. Um, the way my friend Caesar McDowell uh, put it is nothing about us without us. Right? We should remember that. I would either give all the money to Ryan and this team, Kamonix and Rand, <laughs> Uh, or I would focus on the science and technology of self-regulation, how you restore sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system balance so we don't go around interpreting everything as a threat, especially an identity threat. Okay, and we are at noon, so please give yourselves a big round of applause. Thank you very much for the panel. And enjoy your lunch. It's right outside the door. We have access to it. Right. You bet. Thank okay. you. That was awesome.